This is Paul Burnett interviewing Mr. Len Harris for the uh, Global Mining and Materials Research Project of the uh, business series. And it's February 14th, 2015. And we're here at the uh, Hyatt Regency Hotel in Denver, Colorado. So when you arrived um, at uh, Cerro de Pasco, uh, you were impressed by the size and complexity of this yeah, facility. Uh, yeah, and I, I, I previously knew something about it. You know, and I'd been, uh, <coughs> I'd been made aware of it by going into their office in New York. You know, mm -hmm. before I went there, and uh, my arrival, the day I arrived, I, I got a malaria attack. And right, went, uh, right. Went to the hospital. Mm -hmm. Came out of hospital. It's in March now, nineteen fifty-five, <clears throat> and I went into the research department, the research metal area, and we uh, worked on a lot of different projects, different ore bodies, and like you say, all the way through this integrated thing from the mines through the mills down into the smelters and the refineries. Finished product. Mm -hmm. We produce high grade metals there, very high grade. Mm -hmm. The only problem we had was with copper. Uh, the copper was high in bismuth, mm -hmm. and bismuth is poison for mm -hmm. copper. It makes it brittle. Right. So when you draw it into wire, particularly very thin wire, it breaks all the time. And uh, I got called up to New York while I was there. Metal in New York said, you know, we make very good quality metals. You know, they're all all the metals are there that, that we produce. Right. Except for copper. <coughs> you need to do something about it. The only thing was that uh, we could say about it was that we were selling the copper to uh, China. Mm. And maybe it'd blow up in their face in the Korean War. <laughs> Uh, but we never could solve that problem. Mm -hmm. This was uh, just deadly for yeah. copper. Yeah. But uh, uh, it uh, was a very successful company. Mm -hmm. It was the biggest tax player, tax payer in Peru at that time. Mm. And uh, so I went, and then it was nationalized. It went from the, one of the Minister of Mines made a talk one time. Mm. Cerro de Pasco went from the biggest payer of taxes in Peru to the biggest drain on the government oh, by goodness. nationalizing. Well, this is something that's happening. So a lot of, I don't want to say a lot, but a number of significant South African, South, sorry, South yeah. American economies um, were, were too dependent on the metals industry. So, yeah. so Chile, I think 70 yeah. percent yeah. Of government revenue came from copper, uh, yeah. sorry, from uh, from Anaconda and the other operators yeah. there, yeah. and so that skewed. How does that affect the the, the politics in in those countries? Yeah, right? very much to the left. Yeah, and for the first time in 1968, you know, Peru is famous or infamous for all of the military dictators they've had right. over the years. <laughs> They were all rightist dictators until '68. This general uh, Velasco Alvarado took mm -hmm. over as a leftist. He denied being a communist, but they were following the Yugoslav line. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. that you could own some of your properties, and if you had more people employed than others, and you could keep it. And otherwise, so it was a a mixed, mixed market, yeah. Yeah, mixed. And they, they nationalized a lot of industry. And uh, we had, a, it was very tur turbulent times, lots of strikes, 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 strikes. Mm. They were under the influence of, uh, or trying to get under the influence of uh, Cuba. Mm -hmm. Cuba was creating problems there, you know, even Che Guevara mm -hmm. went through Peru. Mm -hmm. And uh, finally they made it just pretty well impossible for foreigners to live there. 
They made people bring all their bank accounts back to Peru. So they, you couldn't hold foreign currencies? Couldn't hold foreign currencies. And they made no doubts about it. They would <coughs> open your letters quite brazenly, you know? Mm -hmm. Find out you had a bank. You had to bring all your money back. Hmm. So it uh, became increasingly more and more difficult, beginning, as I say, with the foreigners, but then later it spread into the Peruvians, too. Hmm. Yeah. They had this uh, junta. They figured they knew everything. Mm -hmm. There was a school that they'd go to, was called uh, Escuela de Alta Militari, something like that. They mm -hmm. learned a bit of law, a bit of engineering, a bit of medicine, and a bit of this accounting, lawyers, and they, so they they figured they didn't need anybody. They could run it all. <laughs> right, yeah. right. It's yeah. like the Ecole Normale Superior so ran it in into France. The ground. Right. 17,000% inflation. By the end of the period, by the early 70s? They changed the money into what they called inti. Inti in uh, English, in English is the sun, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. in Quechua. And there was one inti, one dollar. Like a year later, it was one million inties to one dollar. Unbelievable. People didn't have anything. You know, the, how could you live like that to pay in the hotel to pay your bill twice, twice a day? <laughs> Anyhow, <clears throat> I got a, a letter in the mail of some people that uh, had worked there before, and they went to work in Marcona, you know, which is now a Chinese owned. Mm -hmm. And this fellow, he sent me a letter. He said, you know, we're looking for somebody with your capabilities to run an operation in Australia. Mm -hmm. And I said to Rose, well, it's starting to look pretty difficult here. They wouldn't allow uh, professionals to leave the country, proven professional, couldn't leave the country. You couldn't take out very little money out of the country. And I said to Rose, this is only going to get worse, you know. Meanwhile, I got appointed as an advisor to the Minister of Mines, took away my passport. And uh, Rosa being a nurse, which is professional, I thought the next thing they got to stop her from leaving the country. Mm -hmm. So I arranged for her to go out of the country and stay with a friend in Miami. Because I said, you know, I'm a foreigner. They can't stop me from leaving the country. Mm -hmm. Sooner or later, I have to go. So I saw her off at the airport, and at the airport, they handed me my passport. Mm -hmm. So it was very difficult times, and uh, all this nationalization left and right. And they were, you know, I say the Yugoslav type of uh, communism, which is, I don't know too much about Yugoslavia, Paul, but there's a guy called Gilas who wrote several books. He was the right hand man of. Uh, Tito? Tito? Tito. Yeah. And he was uh, very much against the system. And he wrote several books. One was called The New Class. Mm -hmm. The New Class was the military. Mm -hmm. They got everything. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what Peru was. Mm -hmm. You go into a restaurant, it's full of military people. Mm -hmm. You go to uh, sports events, they're all military people. Uh, a lot of emphasis on keeping the military that's not going to work. So mm -hmm. later, this thing is going to collapse. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We better get out of here. So I went this and I went back to Australia. Mm -hmm. Can I ask you, a, I guess, a personal question? Um, you, you mentioned that the law required people to hold their money in the currency, in the local currency. Um, did you lose a lot in that? In, in leaving the country, well, were, were you able to keep uh, uh, money in? The problem is the black market. Yeah. Now it's on the black market, <coughs> you got much more for your dollars than on the legal market, you know? Right. As they started on the banks and left with one bank. Government bank was the only bank left. And when I was traveling now from uh, New York to Peru, you had declared what money you're bringing into the country, and you have to declare what you're taking out, and where did you change it? Yeah? 
to prevent this black market going yeah. on. Yeah. So uh, I didn't uh, have much, but I had invested in a in an apartment, I had an apartment in Lima, mm -hmm. which was a valuable piece of property, you know. Mm -hmm. But I could see that the writing was on the wall. It's not going to be for us. Right. So that's why I went back to Australia. Yeah. I went quickly after getting the letter from this guy to be mine manager of the salt operation. Mm -hmm. And uh, we all know how things turned out, looking back. Um, but at the time, what did things look like in terms of how things were going in Peru and in the world? How did it feel to you? It did. Look, it looked very bad in Peru. But in the home office in New York, they weren't exposed to this day-by-day -day thing. They didn't see why there was a great deal of problem. Yeah? But they went on to it every day. Mm -hmm. The world at that time, what was the was Korean War, no? Mm -hmm. yeah, 68 was the Korean War. Uh, Vietnam. Vietnam. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that was going on that. Right. It was the upsetting of the world, as you know. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I beat the Vietnam, you know, I went to Vietnam yeah, afterwards. Mm. But uh, everything looked pretty grim, particularly in the mining industry. Yeah. It looked like we we're going to go anywhere, you know. Right. The oil price was way down in those days. Mm -hmm. Silver, I mean, I was looking at some papers the other day on a project that I was working on in Peru. 80 cents copper was uh, uh, it's silver. Mm -hmm. Silver was 80 cents. Mm. Copper was 70 cents. Well, and uh, pretty hard to make money at those prices, you know. The silver was 80 cents a pound, or 80 cents an ounce. Uh, 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 silver. Silver. I uh, sorry. Uh, silver was 80 cents an ounce. Right. And copper, and copper was 60, 70 cents an ounce. Right. Yeah. It didn't look very good at all. The no. mining industry was in a big slump yeah. there in the, uh, the end of the 60s, 70s. Mm -hmm. so, and then there's nationalization right. going on, first in Chile mm -hmm. and then into Peru, you know, made the other situation worse. Yeah, yeah. So there's, I guess, decreased global demand for things like copper. Yes, uh, there right. was a, a recession. There was. And so that... Yeah, like I said, this copper... Well, we, uh, we left the, talking about that, this copper and the fish, fish cages. And this is only relatively recently that the Chileans grabbed onto this. Mm -hmm. The fish cages, you know, and this, where they're the, breeding particularly salmon. Yeah, the farm and fish farms. made out of a nylon netting, which ultimately rots the seawater, builds up a lot of barnacles on it, Mm -hmm. And that doesn't happen with this alloy that we made with the Nicholas here. Mm -hmm. So they ran with it and they closed all of their uh, fish farms, this expanded copper nickel alloy. Chile is it. That's very innovative. Mm -hmm. And of course, today they are the biggest exporter of salmon in the world. <laughs> yeah. So there was this uh, creativity that followed. On With the, the Chicago Boys, yeah, yeah. and then we were talking about that a bit off camera. That the, the tumult of the early '70s gave way to um, was that Freeman was the professor, was he? Milton Friedman and yeah, Arnold Milton Harberger Freeman. and um, yeah, uh, a, a number of them. But I think uh, Arnold Harberger was, I think, in charge yeah. of the Chile project. And, and uh, yeah, they looked around and what what else can Chile produce? You know, not so dependent on copper, right? price of copper was down, although I think those mines have always made money. Mm -hmm. There's a high rate deposits, you know, yeah, yeah, easily the, treatable. Yeah. I mean, I think, so, yeah, the, the, the Chilean copper mines produce an enormous amount, enormous proportion of the world's copper, yeah. don't they? To yeah. This, to this day. Yeah. So. Oh, it's a third of the world's copper. <laughs> One third. <laughs> That's a lot of copper. It's hard yeah. to fathom. Um, so there's this tumult, and then it gives way to to uh, opportunities for for innovation. Um, but for you personally, you um, like just before we leave the early '70s, um, uh, one 
important splashy thing that came out in 1972 was the Club of Rome report. And I remember that one of the, uh, and the, 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 it's this kind of, it, it sounded an alarm about, not about the ebb and flow of markets, but about the total supply of essential commodities and the, versus the population of the earth and uh, the human population of Earth and the projected growth in the human yeah, population. Yeah, we're going to run out of these. Right, right. Yeah. And they all, all the, it's, it's just curve after curve of just yeah. downward uh, uh, dwindling resources, and copper is among them. Yeah. Um, was that something that the industry uh, talked about at all in terms of like total reserves? Is that something that. You know, Sarah Pasco was still doing pretty good. Yeah. yeah because I left there. In 71, yeah? And they were, before they were nationalized, which was a long time ago, they were making $30 million a year, mm -hmm. which is a lot of money in those days. Yeah. So they weren't too bad because they were diversified. And that's what the chairman of the company wanted to do, to diversify it. Mm -hmm. And uh, with Cyril, finally went too far diversified into things outside of mining, right. like trucking, hmm. films, and this kind of thing that nobody knew anything about because they were all brought up in the mining industry. Right. Right. So they had to bring in another guy uh, to handle these, say, these different things. His name was Murphy, hmm. advertised in the uh, Wall Street Journal. And he became president of the company and he started to take it very much in this direction, diversifying not only in country and not only in commodity, but also uh, get out of the mining business altogether. Because, like you say, people were thinking very badly this mining business was going anywhere. And they, he thought they're preparing for the business by going out of mining completely. Well, not completely, but I mean, not completely dependent on mining. Right, hedging it with other more and profitable other, uh, areas. A trucking company that yeah. took over and this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, it ended up there. They were all, all a failure. They were all, because the Sierra de Pasco Corporation was formed back in 1901. Mm -hmm. so they had uh, you know, a great school in mining and metallurgy. Didn't know anything about these other things. <laughs> Finally, they got into a problem with the president being brought in to handle these things. They ousted the chairman mm -hmm. in New York. The board ousted. Mm -hmm. He was on vacation somewhere or other on the board. Oh, this is Murphy who was ousted? Yeah, throughout. Uh, Robert Koenig was the. Uh, was the, was the chairman for a long time, mm -hmm. from Alsace Lorraine, you know, in France there. Yeah. And, uh, but he was the one that got the idea too of too much into mining, too much into South America. Now, uh, we did have a refinery down in, uh, in Missouri, a copper refinery there, and fabricating plants over in Long Island and in Pennsylvania, making wire and tubing, you know, because that's still a big use for copper tubing. Yeah, they were very uncertain years, you know? Mm -hmm. And well, I thought, well, I'm just not gonna get any better. I applied to have my diploma uh, credited and with the College of Engineers which is that I'm now a member of, mm -hmm. they wouldn't accredit it. They had no intention of accrediting foreigners' uh, diplomas mm -hmm. and degrees. Mm -hmm. So uh, anyhow, uh, it went on. Cerro de Pasco, as you know, got nationalized. Yeah. They were not compensated at first, but later on they did get some compensation. Mm -hmm which was way below the value of the company sure. in that case. Yeah. But I say in Chile it was 
fair compensation was under. <laughs> so I was in New York at the time, and uh, Senator Pasco got nationalized. Mm -hmm. So I stayed on there, but they said they wanted to keep somebody on the payroll connection with Middle Asia who could speak Spanish. Mm -hmm. There was still interest in Latin America. But uh, it finally went and collapsed. You know, the, the Prisca people took over the company. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Prisca? Priskers. Okay. They took, you know, familiar with that family? No. Jewish family out of Chicago. Very rich people, and they are experts at their in uh, taking over companies in bad shape. There's a lot of money in the kitty, mm -hmm. and that's exactly what they did here. Mm -hmm. They took over the company with money that was lying in the in the banks of the uh, Federal Reserve. Okay, and the whole thing collapsed. Yeah, yeah. the Pritzkers, right? Okay. The Pritzkers took it over here. Yeah. Okay. Um, and so the writing was on the wall to get out of yeah of Peru, and you got out of Peru, and you were in. Uh, well, in my case, being an Australian, and I haven't gotten a letter from this guy. They're looking for a general manager in Australia. Salt operation. It just tipped it completely my way. And, right. Uh, they wanted an Australian, if possible, to mm -hmm. be in charge. Right. And so that's where I went to salt mine. And as you know, we did very well there. We produced four million tons of salt a year. It cost uh, two two dollars a ton to produce, two dollars a ton to ship Japan, and sold it for six dollars. Mm -hmm. so it was a good little operation. <laughs> that is pretty good. Yeah. And you mentioned off camera you you ended up producing four million tons. Yes. But what did you start with? 300,000. 300,000. Yeah. So you increased uh, dramatically, you know, yeah. tenfold, uh, more, more than tenfold. Yeah, it's, uh, it was a great experience, Paul. When I went back to Australia, that was after 18 years that I'd left. Mm -hmm. And I found the country very much changed, mm -hmm. very negative. Yeah. And the uh, the unions took over the country in 1972. Mm -hmm. uh, and all the government was you know, union organizers or union representatives. The prime minister himself had been nothing else hmm. but a, a union rabbit if you like. You know? <laughs> and, uh, but uh, what was my point I was going to talk about? Well, that you it, it, you'd come back and it had changed. It had oh yeah, uh, changed the negative. There was a, a, a lot yeah. more. Every time I opened my mouth, we tried that. Didn't work. Now that won't work. Our people will never accept that. You know, or this kind of thing. So I called all the superintendents in my office one day and I said, "Look, what happened to the saying in Australia? Let's give it a bash." Yeah. Well, huh? that's what they used to say. So we had an incident that happened. We had 13 trucks on the road there. And they were all driving with Toyota, to Yokohama tire. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Came about that we couldn't get these tires. Something had happened in a factory, I don't remember. And we had a contractor on site, a company called Brambles, big people in the trucking business in Australia. And they had a foreman there, we had a small contract going on, moving, earth moving. Yeah. And he said, I understand you're having trouble getting tires. I said, yeah. He said, well, have you ever thought about uh, Michelin tires? I said, look, tell you the truth, I didn't want tire from, her, from another. He said, well, we have 40,000 trucks on the road in Australia. And they all use Michelin tires. Why? Because we're the Michelin tire representatives. So, all right, so I said to my assistant, I said, you know, I just talked to this guy, Ryan was his name. He said, if you put those tires on our trucks, you got a strike on your hands tomorrow. Hmm. What are you talking about? 
He said, our drivers won't drive, we'll be so tired. So anyhow, I went back to the foreman and I said, you know, this is the answer I got about the tire. He said, well, we work two 12-hour shifts. He said, you bring in the, the later shifts <coughs> and let the other ones off an hour earlier, we can bring up the experts from Perth, which they did. <coughs> this guy incidentally went on vacation. Uh, he had to go later on, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, anyhow, he, uh, they got up and, and I called all the drivers to come into the meeting, explain what they do, which is this guy like. After it was all over, I got up and I said to the drivers, well, what do you think? And the union rep said, let's give it a bash. That's the Australia I knew. You know? Yeah, yeah. We put mission tires on those trucks and they're still driving with mission tires. <laughs> <laughs> so it just required some conversations. Yeah, I, yeah I turned, I turned, that was the main thing I did, Paul. I turned around their thinking to be positive, yeah. not negative. Right. And every time I opened my mouth, that won't work. Up people will you got strikes on your hands, all this stuff. Yeah. By taking the positive attitude, that's why we went up. Yeah. Yeah. You know? And that uh, th that uh, theory of mind, you know, planning, organization, and uh, control, delegation. Yeah. That worked well. Yeah. Now we you said the the original saying from the American Management Association was planning organization and something. Yeah, it was called planning organization and control. Mm -hmm. And I added delegation to it. Mm -hmm. plan, you have to have a plan mm -hmm. and you have to have an organization to carry out that plan. And there's no, no sense in telling a truck driver you have to produce, you have to, we're producing four million tons of salt a year. What does that mean to him? It doesn't mean anything. Right. <laughs> So many trips from the mine to the port yeah. you have to make on your ship. Yeah. And that will fall right into the plan. Yeah. That's all he needs to know. Yeah. If you do that, we'll have the then we'll get up in the production. Right, right. And it worked, Paul. It yeah. worked. Yeah. Yeah. And I turned it around completely. Yeah. When I left, uh, one of the people said to me, you know, you done a good job here, you turned this company around. There's one thing you had to do though is control the weather. <laughs> I said, yes, I can. Mm -hmm. He said, how would you do that? You know, in Australia, they give people long vacations, like a month, a year. When it was raining, I'd shut it down, mm -hmm. send everybody on vacation. I had uh, another problem there that, uh, you know, in Australia, that they have bars at the mines, mm -hmm. which I don't think is a good idea. Probably not. Yeah. But anyhow, uh, we worked uh, six days a week, and all of the superintendents would turn up on Sunday at the mine. And the women complained to me about their husbands having to go to work seven days a week. What's going on here? We had a bar on the mine. And the bars didn't open in the town. Simple as that. They go on to drink beer at the mine because they couldn't get a drink in, in Carnarvon. So I cut that out. I said, no, we only one superintendent every Sunday. That's all we need. Yeah. Yeah. And then I can tell you this rain, it rained four inches a year, but it rained all in two days. Very flat country. <laughs> So the whole countryside was flooded. Yeah. And it took a long time for that water to go down. But the mine itself, after the storm was over, within a few days, you could put it back into production. Right. I stayed on site. I found out I was the only guy staying there. <laughs> you were the staying only there. Yeah, you were the only Because everybody took off to town, right. worried about the hurricane and their families. Right. No, that's not going to work. Hmm. So I work. Some of you guys have to stay with me at the mine. Others will go into town, look after the families, make sure they don't have problems with the hurricane, and we can get started up at the mine before you can get to the mine. Yeah. Because the roads were flooded. Right. Right. So there, there were two big problems which I overcame. Right. 
Right. And it sounds like you were, um, it, we off camera, you showed me these beautiful photographs of the, of the operation that you had there. Yes, right. Yeah. 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 Um, and In desert country, you know. And uh, it, it, you um, engineered this incredible throughput of the salt um, uh, evaporation ponds and then using a kind of modified snow plow to um, harvest. Essentially, you literally have a harvester. That's like correct. you would, like you're we harvesting. Har we call grain. them harvesters. Yeah, you're harvesting salt. Harvest. salt. Yeah, and then you're, um, you know, uh, essentially plowing it down uh, a hill into these conveyors that take it to port. And it's this, you know, it's uh, it's you can see why it, it increased the production tenfold. Yeah. With this kind of this kind of setup, so this is kind of a return for you because if I'm not mistaken. You had managerial responsibility in Ghana, and yes. you were in charge of metallurgy overall at Cerro de Pasco. But Cerro de Pasco is huge, yeah, right. yeah. and so when you came to Texada Mines in in uh, Cape Cuvier in Western Australia, you're you're the you're the director of all. Yeah, I was the thing. top man in the company at mine site. Yeah. So that that was. From my point of view, it was very good because I could then put into practice what I saw as the way to do it. Right. And it worked. Right. It worked. Right. Did you apply lessons learned from that experience to other things that you did subsequently? There's one of those papers there, Paul, which is partly concerning that, is plant design, what not to do. <laughs> yeah. And uh, that's based on my you know, sixty odd years of, of practice of uh, in operations, particular mm -hmm. <laughs> that uh, people keep keep committing the same mistakes over and over, mm -hmm. and uh, particularly with engineering firms, and uh, they uh, they have to break that, you know, get away with it. Now so this 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 was a symposium. Was held in Phoenix. They asked me to write a paper, and I thought, well, this is the time to put a lot of this down on paper. That uh, what not to do. Right. Yeah. Was very well received. Mm -hmm. Very well. Re what are a couple of examples of things not to do? I don't want to get too technical, uh, but, but general principles that are shortcomings. One, or of, one of the main things was repeating mistakes. By the engineering firms, they would build into the into the, <clears throat> into the drawings certain certain uh, equipment. It didn't work. Mm -hmm. The next time you come around, they got the same mistake in there again. We tried to overcome this at Newmont. We set up a three-man committee, all people about my age, with lots of experience. So, whenever we were working on a new project or expanded project, it came to us first mm. to look for these uh, uh, pitfalls, we call them. Yeah. yeah. And eliminate for the next time around. Right, right. Uh, well, let me see, let me refresh my memory there a little bit. Have a look at okay. that paper. <laughs> it has been, it has been the author's experience. Since he began his career as a, an indentured cadet metallurgist at Mount Morgan Limited in Australia in 1943, that many mistakes have been made in the past when designing mineral processing plants. Unfortunately, many of these same mistakes continue today by engineering firms, and in some cases by the operators themselves. A list of items that should not be done prior to and at the design stage presented and discussed in some detail consideration for those concerned the side of the business. Yeah? Now, uh, oh, don't skimp on the test work. Mm -hmm. yeah? Don't skimp on the test work. Yeah. That's a good principle. That's the first one. Yeah. A kind of adjusted version of measure twice, cut once. 
<laughs> Don't forget your economics 101 class. <laughs> the idea is to make money. It's economics. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Don't leave certain important people off the design team. Mm -hmm. Their tendency to leave mechanical people off of the design team. We started at Newmont, we put always a mechanical person on. If somebody's got to do the maintenance in these plants, mm -hmm. they should be in it right at the beginning. Mm -hmm. When purchasing used equipment, don't send a boy to do a man's job. <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> well, we had uh, this, these cases that somebody go out and have a look at the equipment who really wasn't qualified to look at the equipment. Mm -hmm would approve it. We had a case like that in Mexico. Mm. Bought some uh, uh, used plant equipment, much cheaper than you could put in you. Mm -hmm. But we ended up having to put another million dollars into it yeah. to bring it up to shape. Right. If you sent a good mechanical engineer to have a look at it in the first place, you probably never bought it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Don't jam the equipment into the smallest possible space. Mm -hmm. Don't install faulty electrical switchgear or located in the tight corners of potential wet areas. <laughs> this electrical. sounds yeah. this sounds really basic and yet and yet yeah, yeah. this is something that's it happened over and, over and over and over. Absolutely right, it's basic. Yeah. Don't place the equipment on faulty foundations oh my God. or on weak ground. Oh my God. <laughs> and there's been many cases of that, Paul. Oh. A big crusher I know they've installed in Peru. The whole thing collapsed yeah. before they even put the plant in operation. Right. Yeah. Don't install unworkable chutes below ore stockpiles and fine ore bins. Mm -hmm. You never get it out of the bins. Right. Don't be stingy on installing duplicate vital equipment. Mm -hmm. Don't install defective equipment. <laughs> Don't hesitate to use the natural contours of the ant. You know, in the early days, all the mills were built on the slope of a hill. Mm -hmm. So you could gravitate the pulp down. Right. Now you have to pump it. Right. And in Ghana, I saw they put pumps down in a well. Yeah. <laughs> the wells get flooded and knocks out all the motors. Right, right. Don't fail to install adequate safety guards on machinery and motors and prepare safety manuals along with the plant design. Mm. Don't wait to the last minute to prepare operator training manuals. Don't hesitate to design the plant to be a pleasant place to work in. <laughs> That's not a small matter, right? Yeah. In terms yeah. of yeah. like you say, these are all basic things. Yeah, yeah. But the very fact that you felt compelled to write this yeah. list yeah. speaks to the fact that these lessons haven't been learned in a lot of cases. Don't over automate the operations of the plant. Mm -hmm. A lot of people completely automate the plants and the, the operator can't get in. Mm. The opposite to that is the plant we had in Canada and British Columbia, where we had a, a continuous online analyzer. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> they hooked these up to controls. Mm -hmm. And it goes out, you know, nobody knows how to get in there or change it. We just had this thing to show what the assay results were. Mm -hmm. and gave the operator an instrument right. to help him with his job. Right, but not as a complete replacement. Yeah. Right. Don't neglect the environment. <laughs> the big a, passage that's on That's a that. big one. That's a big one, yeah. So there are all these rules that, um, that you've gleaned from your experience. Yeah. And one, one of the basic things, don't build the mill before you have a mine. <laughs> I've seen that done. That's, of course, ob that's obvious, isn't it? It, it is. People do it. Uh, how, we, how would that work? How would you build a mill before you had a mine? How could, how could you? We built one in Kentucky. Oh, in Paducah, Kentucky. It's not the only one. Mm -hmm. There's one I was associated with. 
they put all the emphasis on the plant. Mm -hmm. Put a lot of money into the plant on the plant. They couldn't get the ore out of the mine <laughs> because it was right raining underground all the time. It was saturated with water. The plant is lying out in the corn cornfields down there in it's, it's still there. It's still there. Still there. Yeah. Bits and pieces of it. Right, right. That's the basic. You think it's the basic, don't you? Yeah. You know? Yeah. Why, 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 why should you have to re remind people about this? Yeah? <laughs> but it's, anyway, uh, don't design and build the mill until you have a mine. <laughs> now, this, I said, you know, this is number one yeah. in the don'ts. Sounds very obvious, doesn't it? Yeah. But, wait, wait, sounds very obvious, doesn't it? But the author is aware of several cases where it occurred and several other cases that were near misses. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, it's uh, you know, they, they like this. Yeah. And another one is that buying equipment, they don't always inspect it beforehand. Mm -hmm. We had a installed an electric generator in Mexico. It blew up in two weeks. A brand new, how could that happen? Yeah. Yeah. How could that happen? Yeah. We had rotary kilns, yeah. which have a ring on the outside, where the ring came off. You had to pull the whole thing down and re-weld it. We had two of them, so we dropped the production by 50%. So this uh, is not a small... So something, a mistake like that can cost how much? A lot of money. Millions of dollars. Oh, yeah, it could. Yeah, well, I don't know. <clears throat> Look, it probably took more than a month to get that rotary, uh, yeah. rotary furnace back into operation. Right. Uh, we were producing what, I don't know, something like, say, uh, 10,000 ounces of gold a month in this particular property. <laughs> you go to half production, it's 5,000 ounces of gold. Right. At $1,000 an ounce, a lot of money. That's right. That's right. So you have learned lessons from, from managing and, uh, and you've passed those on in these kinds of educational articles and you've lectured and we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more. I want to pass now to asking you about the transition to, uh, to Newmont, which is a, another long period in your career. Uh, can, so can you talk about how you ended up moving to Newmont after, uh, after Texada Mines? Uh, <clears throat> I was um, working in New York for Santa Pasco Corporation mm -hmm. when this uh, nationalization took place. Mm -hmm. So I went to Newmont, it was in the same building mm -hmm. in New York, mm -hmm. in Park Avenue, and I knew some of the people there, again, who'd come from Santa Pasco, mm -hmm. and said, what about a job? I said, okay, so I interviewed with the chairman, who had played a Mellon Seymour, and the president, who was uh, Thompson, I forget his first name. Mm. He said, okay, yeah, come work for us. And uh, so I got transferred to Danbury, where Newmont had their research and development. The geophysicists were also located there, where they have very uh, fragile instruments mm -hmm. and they wanted to take it outside the New York City because the interference right uh, in seventy in Danbury mm -hmm. and uh, then I was in Danbury I don't know for a few years uh, the first place I went to was South Africa mm -hmm. and uh, Namibia yeah. in particular did a lot of work there with them I later became a director of those companies. And uh, then I, the, the uh, vice president of research and development was retiring. So they made me first assistant vice president mm -hmm. to him. Then when he retired, I took over his job, mm -hmm. vice president of research and development. Mm -hmm. We moved then from New York to Denver. And in the move, some people didn't want to move from New York. And we felt they were important people, mm -hmm. that they should come. 
So I gave up my position as vice president of research and development and became vice president of metallurgical operations. Mm. And uh, I worked all over the world, all over the world, mm. looking for projects in Eastern Europe and Spain and uh, was it back in South America. Mm -hmm. Okay, because when I was still, after I left uh, Yanacocha, I became president and general manager of Newmont Peru mm -hmm. and vice president and general manager of uh, Newmont Latin America. Yeah. Yeah. So then when I was, the way that Newmont worked, it was a holding company. Yeah. They had bits and pieces of different companies. Mm -hmm. Some of them later on, they took over 100%, like Magma Copper Company. And these companies in South Africa, they'll keep Copper Company and Sumer. They never changed it. Palabora was a percentage, it was 20 or 30 percent. So uh, they had in New York City so called experts in the various uh, fields, right? Like uh, lawyers, right? Accountants, engineers. Uh, metallurgical people mm -hmm. like myself, and also uh, the metallurgical operations, mine operations. And the task was to go around to these places <coughs> and look for ways of doing things better and cheaper. Right. Uh, right. So you were involved in assessing um, the efficiency of overall operations of these yes. of these and, subsidiaries. and new projects and new projects and new projects yeah yeah existing projects how we could increase the recoveries mm -hmm. and the new projects that were being built mm -hmm. yeah so that that was my responsibilities mm -hmm. uh, and uh, as a result of that time we opened up the mine in Uzbekistan. Mm -hmm. A joint venture with the Uzbek government. This was after the Sarushan. collapse. After the collapse of the former Soviet Union. Pardon? Was this after the collapse of the USSR? It started off before. Mm -hmm. it started off before. There was a geologist, a friend of mine, very interesting guy. His name is Joko Wallach, and he was born in a German slave labor camp. His father was a coal miner, mm -hmm. and the Germans took him first to Germany and then to Belgium to work in the coal mines. And he speaks all of these Slav languages, mm -hmm. uh, Yugoslav, Polish, his father was Pole, mm -hmm. Russian. And he went to a meeting in Moscow in, uh, let me think, it must be in 91. Mm -hmm. And that while he was there, some of the people from Sarushan invited him to come visit. He was the first foreigner in there in 70 years. In which, in which city? In Uzbekistan. In Uzbekistan, okay. In 70 years, mm -hmm. he was the first foreigner. Oh. And he saw there that uh, they were milling, they had huge mills over a mile long. 2,000 people worked only in the mill. And uh, of course, it was communist, you know, and there were a lot of this. The whole plant was staffed by a gulag. Yeah. You know? And uh, so I went with him then on the next trip, and they had stockpiled a lot of relatively low grade material, mm -hmm. uh, milling through their mills three grams per ton. And they were taking stuff out at one and a half grams per ton. Yeah, which today is all. Mm -hmm. And we saw it as all. See, the idea of heap leaching had not reached uh, uh, the USSR yet. Mm -hmm. So we made a deal with them. One third the Umont, one third the Uzbek government, and one third the uh, geological society. They had a Enormous amount of geologists. The Russians and those other states, very good geologists, mm -hmm. very good. Of course, they don't know anything about making money. There's something else. 
<laughs> like I say, don't forget your economics. Right, what. right, right. And uh, so we set up this deal there, which uh, started off very well, you know. And the Uzbek government was selling their gold to Central, to Moscow, mm -hmm. $40 an ounce. And when it was an open market at that time, it must have been about $400 an ounce. Mm -hmm. So they asked Newmont, they wanted to break away from Russia. They didn't like the Russians at all. Mm -hmm. And uh, if the Newmont would take over the marketing of their gold as well from the existing plant, they're producing over a million ounces of gold wow. a year. That's, yeah. This place did not appear on the map, it didn't exist. Officially. It Officially. Didn't, it didn't exist. It was in the middle of where they produce all the uranium. Right. The uranium area. Right. So there are towns, whole towns that don't actually exist. Yeah, it was very close. <laughs> I was driving through there and this guy said, uh, you want to take some pictures? No, I'm not taking any pictures here. This was, this was just uh, uh, before they even broke away. And then right. The next thing, 1992, I was in uh, Russia, Siberia, mm. when uh, the whole thing fell apart in Russia, you know, yeah. with Yeltsin and everything. Right, sure. I was there that, that same weekend. Yeah. And uh, they had a, in Moscow, they said, you see that building over there? I said, yeah. He said, that's the tallest building in Moscow. I said, what do you mean? It looks like four or five stories. He said, yeah, but underground. It's 20 or 30 story. <laughs> we took off that Sunday from Moscow. There was a huge statue of the guy beside the KGB. I don't remember his name any other. One of those long Russian names. Yeah. We got lost. We got lost in Uzbekistan. We didn't know where we were. My wife was frantic. Mm. Couldn't make contact. Mm -hmm. We were lost in this place called Sarashan. Nobody knew where it was, didn't exist. Couldn't get us out of there. The nearest place to get out was Afghanistan. Yeah. And that the road coming into Sarf Shan would suddenly wide way up, out, and they closed gates. Yeah. Both ends, about five miles long, yeah. a mile wide, bombing Afghanistan from near the mine. That's, uh, that's in uh, U.S. control now, that, uh, that, air, that airstrip. Okay. The nearest place was Afghanistan. Wow. And now finally we did get out. <coughs> when I came back to the States, the CIA contacted me. What did you see there? They didn't know what was going on. They thought it had something to do with uranium. Yeah. But just this enormous gold, gold plant, yeah. huge open pit, it didn't yeah. exist anywhere. Interesting. But that fell apart too, you probably know, Paul. They, yeah. they nationalized that later on. Mm -hmm. They raised the taxes. The contract was written at 30% tax. They wanted to raise that. The Uzbek government. The Uzbek did government. This. Yeah. So it was, it was nationalized, though. So you might lost that. Too. Right. But uh, we had some very interesting times. And I had, like all of us in New York, we had very interesting jobs yeah. going around to Newmont's different operations and potential operations. Mm -hmm. Looking at them was a very, very, very interesting job. Mm -hmm. 